Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to today's installment of the IAC's Diversity in Arbitration Week 2021, organized in collaboration with Arbitral Women. My name is Zhang Anran, and I'm an international case counsel at the AIAC. Today, alongside my co-interviewer, Ms. Jorin Forte, have the privilege of interviewing Ms. Sitman Savanatman on her journey as an international arbitrator with extensive experience in dispute resolution, specializing in maritime, international trade, commercial, and corporate insolvency disputes. Dear Sitman, it is our great pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you, Enran. A pleasure to be here. On that note, I would like to first introduce my co-interviewer, Ms. Shireen. Shireen is a senior associate at June State in Paris. She was a professor of law at University of Paris, Poisson Assas, University of Paris, Poisson Soupon, served as a faculty legal researcher at the Institute of Comparative Law in Paris. She focuses her practice on arbitration, especially international commercial arbitration and investment arbitration under a range of arbitral rules and applicable laws. Shireen is a member of the Board of Directors of Arbitral Women. She is also an active member of many young international arbitration groups worldwide. Thank you, Shireen, for joining me. Thank you so much, Anran, for, for having me and to all of the organizers for putting this uh, event on. And uh, thank you so much to Sitka for, for being here today and for being our, our interviewee. We're, we're very excited to get started. A pleasure, Shireen. Thank you so much. So I will have the, the pleasure of introducing um, Ms. Sitpa Selvaratanam, I hope I pronounced that correctly, who is an advocate and solicitor um, based in Kuala Lumpur in Mal Malaysia. She is a barrister at law. Um, she is an international arbitrator and a founding partner of the law firm Tommy Thomas established in 2000. She is a court member of the International Court of Arbitration of the, of the ICC since uh, July of 2018. And she's also a court member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration since July of 2019. She studied at the University in, uh, of Wales and obtained her LLM from the University of Cambridge. She is regularly appointed as an international arbitrator in various international arbitration um, matters, both uh, focusing on commercial, international trade and commodities disputes, uh, including shipping disputes, and uh, sale of assets um, of various international companies. She has participated in over 30 arbitration cases uh, for very, under various institutional rules as well as uh, ad hoc uh, arbitrations, and notably with the Singapore International Arbitration Center, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, the Asian International Arbitration Center, um, and in all capacities has served either as sole presiding emergency or party nominated arbitrator. She is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and the Malaysian International, uh, excuse me, the Malaysian Institute of Arbitrators. We are absolutely um, thrilled to have her here today with us and are very excited to hear her story today. So we'll move right into the first question. Uh, Sitpa, could you please use three words to describe yourself and your journey um, in international arbitration thus far? Well, Shireen, thank you for that very kind introduction, and I must thank the AIAC for bringing me in and inviting me in this program that they have. is a fantastic program. Three words um, to describe me and my journey in arbitration. Um, purposeful, that will be both me and the journey. Um, and I would say exhilarating, that will be the journey. Um, and I, I would say very blessed. I've been very blessed in this journey and in my individual life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sipan. Thank you, so you are regarded as one of the like, leading world's minds in maritime law and also international dispute settlement. So how is your feeling so far? And how is your experience? And could you share some of your experience, for example, when you 
uh, represent your first case as a counsel and also when you are appointed uh, as an arbitrator for the first time. For the first time, okay. So um, let me take each one of those uh, separately. Um, the feeling, the feeling um, for both being appointed uh, for my first international arbitration uh, case as counsel and the feeling when I got my first appointment as arbitrator um, was of course excitement with cautious optimism you know just it's a great opportunity and one wants to do the very best one can um, so that would have been the feeling totally charged up for it um, the experience um, so if i go back in time um, from as first counsel as counsel uh, in my first international arbitration matter i was second chair i was led by tommy thomas uh, and as part of that team was uh, Alan Gomez um, and quite by, and, and a second chair, you're very comfortable. You know, you're sandwiched between a senior and a junior and oh, that's a good place to be. And then um, all of a sudden, quite unexpectedly, I, I had to um, come up, step up to the platform, uh, step, step up to the plate to do the cross-examination of one of the witnesses um, and also to do oral submissions. So as you probably can imagine, I was absolutely terrified. Uh, you know, hands fully sweaty and you know, one heart palpitating. I still remember so vividly Alan Gomez looking at me, holding my hands and said, you can do this, sits, you can do this. And so I did. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it, but you know, the palpitations never go. Yeah, and the sweaty hands never go away. And um, yes, it was an amazing experience because the tribunal um, was uh, an eminent tribunal. It was Lord Millet. It was Gavin from the UK, uh, Gavin Griffiths from Australia, and Casey Bora from Malaysia. So uh, you can imagine why I had uh, so much nerves on, around me. But they, they treated me so well. We, we did well in that case, we won. And so that experience, I think, was an enormous boost to my uh, confidence and self-esteem. Um, so that would be as counsel. Um, as arbitrator, um, the first appointment came from an institution. And quite a lot of women would say that, that their first break comes from an institution. And we remain always grateful for that. And it was from um, the predecessor of AIC, KLRCA. This would be 13, 14 years ago. And I had uh, completed my diploma in international commercial arbitration in Keble College, Oxford, um, and was conducted by the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. So you can imagine that as well, coming back full of knowledge and thinking, oh, right, I'm ready to get my first appointment. Never quite thinking I would, but I did very quickly after that, the director of KLRCA uh, appointed me on a uh, shipping uh, dispute a charter party dispute. And I was chuffed, uh, totally thrilled. Um, but uh, before the first preliminary meeting could even be held, parties told me that they, they were in negotiations to try and settle it. So, you know, it seemed like, well, too good to be true. But as it turned out, the negotiations failed. Um, they did come back more than a year later, actually. The first um, appointment went through. I heard evidence, um, the oral evidence, and rendered an award. So that, that was a sweet experience. I think it was also um, a, a, a sort of calming experience. It sort of made me more measured, made me look at disputes from a different perspective, finally from a more uh, neutral perspective. Uh, and you think you know all you need to know when you're a counsel, but when you sit um, and watch the dispute and observe the dispute through the lens of a, a, a determinator, a judge, or a, in this case, an arbitrator, it's a whole different ball game. And I enjoyed that very much. So there you go and run that were uh, th Those were my two experiences. It sounds really exciting and um, very, I've got both. So after talk, are you sharing these exciting and sweet moments, so after all these years, like, do you have any challenges that you made? And probably you can give some major challenges that you made in the past years, uh, especially to respond to our uh, theme of the interview. Do you think gender diversity is a uh, potential challenges uh, back to, let's say, a couple, couple years ago and also at this moment? 
Yes, um, absolutely. I mean, any lawyer will tell you that you know, they face, you know, huge problems, huge challenges across the career. And I, I've been in it for 30 years. So there were many hurdles to overcome. And if you ask me to identify three, say, um, I, would, I would rate the gender uh, challenge uh, to be one of the biggest, uh, but it was more in the initial days, not so much now or not at all now, I would say. And the, the gender challenge, um, came from different quarters. They were, they were judges who wouldn't um, hear me out as much as they would um, a male uh, counterpart, male opponent lawyer. Uh, it, would be, it would seem difficult for them to take me as seriously as my male opponent. Um, but over time, as you keep at it, be persistent with it, and they keep seeing you come back, repeatedly and make sense, I think it dissolves. It's no longer about um, who you are. It's more about uh, you know, what gender you are, but what you say and what, what you do. Similarly, I think initially clients um, and also peers, fellow lawyers um, expected a male to lead. And so they would, the question, or be on the team, you know, so who's leading the team or, or where's Mr. So-and-so and be quite surprised that I was doing it on my own or I was dealing with the issues for the clients themselves. But again, um, it was just, you know, the norm or stereotyping at that point in time. And I like to think it's less so now. Uh, and it's, I certainly don't face that at all. In fact, I quite often lead male lawyers, um, whether in court or, or you know, in, in discussions with clients. Um, so that's that would be one of the big gender challenges. And I, I talk about uh, more about the arbitration later on. But um, again, I got my first appointment um, about 13, 14 years ago when I was fairly young, uh, which was lucky for that point in time. Hence why I say I'm blessed. Um, so it, it was good. I was probably at, at the right place at the right time when gender awareness was uh, becoming more um, uh, intense. Uh, and so I got the benefit of that rather than the short end of that straw. The other challenge I think uh, I faced and had to overcome and still tweak it now is trying to balance everything that's important to me in my life, uh, which is my family, my society, uh, my career, and my personal development as well. Uh, and it was more so when both uh, the children and my career were young. And so, you know, that much more commitment was expected of me from both. Uh, as a senior now, you can, you know, afford to delegate a lot more. Uh, the children are grown up, so it's less so now. But one time, uh, it certainly was a huge uh, task to balance everything. But my motto has been, as I often say, if you want it bad enough, uh, you will work at it hard enough. And, and that work is both doing it on the outside and also on the inside, how, how balanced you are and how centered you are on the inside. So that would be uh, the second challenge. And um, and then the third challenge, if I can um, say, probably uh, or, or quote it as probably the biggest challenge um, is to face uh, discrimination and remain centered in the face of that discrimination, uh, which is not gender-based, uh, which is more race based and based on the fact that an ideology of independence is not valued as much as it should. And that does uh, cause a lot of tension within me um, and you know, to remain true to what I believe uh, and not being too frustrated with how other people respond to that. And, and following up on this point of gender diversity, um, which you've uh, so eloquently touched upon, we, of course, being a, a board member of Arbitral Women, which is a co-sponsor of this event, uh, as you know, Arbitral Women is quite uh, active in putting forth uh, candidates and, and names for uh, female arbitrators and increasing um, the visibility of arbitrators. Oftentimes, the, uh, the excuse is that, oh, well, we can't identify a qualified woman, um, but we'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on 
are there qualified women? Are there, you know, women, not just, uh, of course, yourself, but also, you know, potential quo arbitrators, um, potential, uh, you know, have you seen counsel, for instance, in this, this role of um, lead uh, first chair or even second chair? And, and what are your impressions and, and um, efforts to really promote the presence of, of women uh, within the field in an equitable way? Um, thank you, Shireen. That, that's lovely that you've brought up that question. Um, arbitral women have uh, uh, achieved so much. They've made great strides for us. I am a member of Arbitral Women as well. Totally supportive and totally grateful for everything that they've done. Um, and that's absolutely right. It has all, had always been the case that people say, um, we don't know who they are. And that was so true. I mean, we, there might be names, but they're not often faces that they can identify with those names or the qualifications. You see, um, Shireen, it's not enough to know that a, an arbitrator is available and got, has got all the qualifications. Uh, people want to be confident about that person. What is that person's aura and uh, um, ability to hold a hearing, to be fair in the circumstances, to flow with the issues that come? Uh, and all of those are, are, are very um, subtle and very nuanced. And so the database is excellent, but they need to be, then it needs to be more than that. So if you ask me what has been uh, the challenge and, uh, and what have I done to contribute? So let me say this, every time I'm asked um, for um, uh, you know, suggestions of appointment, uh, and it's not, not a small number of occasions of that, uh, I would always suggest women. Yeah. And whether or not they get on to that tribunal uh, is something beyond me, but I would suggest them from my experience of that. And I might get some feedback to say, oh, so and so, but no, this, that and the other. And that's an individual choice. And it may be of, because of personal relationships that have been or have not been developed. But that is the first thing we do, which is give names for appointments. And I have known, I've been a recipient of that, I would often get two um, uh, uh, party nominated male arbitrators who come and say, Sipa, are you free for this? Are you free of conflict? We would like to jointly nominate you as the presiding arbitrator. And sometimes I get it and sometimes I don't. And they said, we tried, we wanted you, but circumstances you know, did not permit. And so that is as much as most of us can do and will do and should do. In fact, that's exactly what it is right now, that we should already be doing all of that because the database is there. We've met with so many people, so we can you know, sort of say, oh, I've seen her, I've heard her, I've, you know, how she writes on this. You can check her out on this platform or that video uh, or, or you know, any number of things are available now to make assessments. Um, and I would say this, that the fact that we have, you know, the pledge, the ERA pledge, um, and people having taken that pledge, and therefore reporting pursuant to that pledge, especially the institutions, have made a huge impact, right? And the initiatives that come from that, which is uh, meet the arbitrators, or um, I think the arbitral women have training on unconscious bias, mentoring systems, um, providing platforms, including this and RUN and AIC, there's a wonderful platform for people to hear for Sam and get a feel of who these women arbitrators are because they are life and they must live in the minds of the potential appoint, uh, appointees yeah, or appointors as the case may be. So these initiatives have taken us a long way, um, but I think there's more to be done. There's still a lot more to be done. Absolutely, and, and thank you so much for touching on those and I'm interested just in one um, follow-up question on, on that on that point. You also discussed uh, race diversity and, and even with gender diversity as well. We encounter often um, because we are in a system of party uh, appointment and you know the centrality of consent of the parties and in, in, in deciding um, you know alternative dispute resolution. It's 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 a bit dif difficult to ensure that uh, unconscious bias is not being confronted in the decision-making process. And you mentioned uh, a large number of initiatives and, and ways to get beyond that, just um, you know, informing, uh, training, and making sure that people are aware of, of, of very you know, highly qualified candidates. Um, and I'm wondering how, how you um, specifically have, have experienced that yourself in terms of um, 
ensuring that the party elements, you know, I think we've seen a lot of progress with institutions moving towards gender diversity, perhaps now a step towards racial diversity as well. But how can we really affect and, and ensure that parties in their nominating process and in their consideration of, of potential candidates for arbitrators and counsel for that matter, um, how can we ensure and then what has been your experience dealing with those, um, you know, those obstacles that, that, are, that are often in place. Right. So uh, that's quite a deep question because so much has gone in, uh, has been invested into uh, creating this awareness. So I can, I, I think um, we've got the, is it called the cross institutional task force uh, that under the eco auspices on um, diversity. And they've come up with a marvelous report, I think it was last year, that talks about the progress we've made in the number of women appointments uh, as arbitrators. But we're still hovering, I think at around uh, 20 and 30%. So we are not fully there. But what we can all safely I think agree that just about everybody uh, in this space is aware, not just of the benefits of having a diverse uh, panel of, of having diversity, gender diversity on a panel, not just the benefits, but of it being essential to a complete wholesome determination of the dispute because not be only because it brings a different perspective, but it, because it also reflects the social uh, and, uh, com and economic composition of society. So we've got past that gate post, right? Um, but we're, we're stuck at 2030. Of course, we're more than we were, say, 10 years ago, but we seem to be stuck at this, despite the level of intensity of the last five years uh, initiatives. Um, I would say that Look, ICC had on its court, and you, you mentioned that earlier, that I was on the ICC court, and in, from 2018, it actually achieved parity of the number of men and women as court members, and that's uh, almost 200 court members, and they manage parity. So that's exemplary, I think. Um, and it shows that it can be done. So we often hear, if only you would take five more minutes to consider who else could be on that on that uh, panel, on the list for that panel, you might just get there. And that's certainly there, uh, not just for institutions or lawyers uh, suggesting it to clients, but the, the clients themselves. But you're absolutely right. We are stuck at that stage where the parties themselves uh, are not biting on this. They are aware of it, but they're not biting uh, quite fully as we would like them to. And this is despite the fact that the data is available, and as you said, you know, Arbitral Women has it, the ERA website has it. In fact, ERA, I think, has now um, a, a committee, a committee, a selection committee that can help you uh, if you need more specific details on it. So it's there to be used. So why are, why are users not using it? So it makes me wonder whether we should be considering more seriously uh, the proposal by Gary Benton, and it's controversial, uh, to get users on board, uh, Gary Benton had this proposal that a, a, a tribunal was inherently defective unless it had diversity on it, yeah, in its composition, not just gender diversity, uh, but any form of diversity in the spectrum of diversity. And so what we would need to stop to look at is whether we've come to that point in time. Um, Parties who come to arbitration, they demand, they demand uh, a fair, uh, uh, independent, and a com competent uh, tribunal to fully and properly resolve their dis disputes. That's their demand. And arbitration has become, has become um, the primary and sophisticated uh, dispute re resolution mechanism. So in that context, I think we need to stop and seriously assess whether we've come to the point where we are prepared to say that a tribunal is incomplete without diversity making up its composition. And if we are, then it's for us institutions and the whole arbitral community to advocate that position, to advocate the acceptance of the principle that the composition is not in keeping with the party's agreement that requires independence, fairness, and competence, unless it has a, a diversity on it. So Shireen, if users 
may need to be dragged on board, then it's mandatory almost not to make this mandatory, but mandatory for the arbitral community to consider this more fully, whether the requirement of diversity, not just gender diversity, but any form of diversity should be a formal requirement. And if we think it is a formal requirement and which then would be in accordance with, uh, then we should flow in accordance with what um, the, the, the task force said, the ICA task force, that it's imperative uh, for us to give social and moral effect to this as part of the global initiative for um, uh, sustainable development. And the arbitral community shouldn't be left behind. We in fact should be leading that, that charge for social uh, and uh, um, sustainable development, for a fuller understanding, for greater confidence in the system with a complete comprehensive panel that has diversity represented on it. There you go, Shari. <laughs> no, thank you so much for the, that explanation and for those thoughts. Um, uh, I think this is, this is really crucial and, and thank you for sharing with our, our viewers this, this, uh, your, your particular views on, on this very important issue. Yeah, it seems like we still have a long way to go, but actually we are on the way to achieve that goal. So after talking about like different diversity, including the gender diversity and also the race diversity. Uh, so how about like, uh, let's say Asian females like you, so in this field, uh, because in my experience would be uh, still the involvement of the Asians in the arbitration, especially involvement of Asian females, was still relatively low. So how do you, do you have some comments on this perspective? I think uh, it's the psyche of the Asian women as well. Uh, and it's the condition, collective conditioning that we need to be brave. But cutting through all of that, what I would say three things would be, be good, really, really good at what you do, uh, be brave, and then be seen to be good and brave. And what, what I mean by, by all of this, um, excellence, you really, excellence has to be your middle, your first name, middle name, last name. Yeah, excellence must ooze out of your pores. Uh, it's not enough to be interested in arbitration, uh, to expect to be on a panel or expect to be, you know, uh, drawn into representing a client. We have to be up there uh, in terms of our quality and skills. So there is no shortcut to it. They just have to be Good. And as I said before, if you want it bad enough, you can be a homemaker and be good, really, really good at what you do. It's a matter of, of um, reorientating ourselves within ourselves and not having internal self-doubts uh, that, that block us from establishing that, right? And sometimes it's, it's also the aura that you project that I can do it, I want to do it, I'm doing it. Yeah, and we do it. So be very good. Um, be brave. Be brave in the sense of be authentic. Um, that there is no perfect or there's no one way of being a female or female arbitrator or female arbitration council. Be authentic to yourself. Why is authenticity so important? That means you must be comfortable with who you are. And part of that uh, person of who you are is that arbitrator or arbitration cons uh, uh, council. And when you're comfortable in your skin with yourself, then you get independence. You don't actually get knocked uh, and the, the wind doesn't get knocked out of you when someone else seems to be doing better than you or seems to be more confident than you. That's their way of pro projecting it. Do it your way. So you become more independent and you're able to hold your principles because you finally have to be very principled, very independent, full of integrity if you're walking this path. And so it begins being, by being authentic to yourself. And then finally, you have to be seen to be all of this, to be good uh, and to be brave because if you're not known, how can we use you or, or bring you in to this beautiful world of arbitration? Um, and that way, the best way, besides all the platforms we've talked about, um, well, engage with all these platforms that we've talked about, all the international communities. Um, that's one way of uh, bringing yourself uh, up to speak with what the international community demands uh, of an arbitrator. Um, you get to understand how they work, how other cultures work. You get to contribute to their understanding of how Asian culture works and how we present ourselves. We're still good, we're still brave, we're still independent, even though we don't look and sound like 
like the, the West. That's okay, but it's a question of the free flow of understanding between cultures. So be part of a wider community by engaging with pro professional institutions, and they give you magnificent platform to be known, the word of mouth moves by, uh, people recognize you, people understand you, and then you're on your way there. Um, it's, it's work, but, but it's worth the work. It's absolutely fulfilling and worth the work. If that's the, your purpose in life, and if that's something that is your calling, then it's worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Sipan. I think your advice is to not only benefit to all the Asian females, but also to every young generation that who are interested in the step in their career in arbitration and worldwide. Yes, thank you so much. We, we are absolutely delighted to have heard your contributions today, Sipan, and thank you for those wise uh, words of advice to the younger generation of females and, and uh, practitioners generally, and to aspiring arbitrators. So we are um, so very happy to have discussed with you today. Thank you, and uh, thank you for promoting uh, the, the mission of gender diversity in your practice and racial diversity as well. And um, we were, it was wonderful to hear from you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Cherie. It's been, you know, such a wonderful experience, this journey, and I always love sharing it. So thank you for inviting me and spending your time with me. Thank you very much. Thank you to AIC for the phenomenal job they're doing on uh, diversity, not just gender diversity, all diversities. Well done.